So let us pray for those who will join in prayer with me. Heavenly Father, you are so, so good to us. I pray that you would be with Pastor Atwell today as he brings forth your word. We know that the gospel is the power. It's your power unto salvation. I pray that you would use your words to open the ears of deaf men today, that they would see that you are their only hope. And I pray that also, Lord, for those who do know you, that Joe would come and he would feed the sheep, that they would continue in the renewing of their minds, and that they would grow in the faith. And also, Lord, right here, right now, we pray for our, our brother as he's going through this time of, of uncertainty with his health. Um, just, if it be your will, we pray that you would heal him, Lord that you would be with him, that you would take away any worries or concern. We come together, all, everyone underneath the sound of my voice, that we join together praying for our brother. And we pray all these things in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Can you see him hanging there on the tree? Dying and bleeding for you. As we sang that old hymn, that's the only thing that crossed my mind. That what a great Savior we have that would do that for us. I'd like to thank uh, Pastor Clark. I feel like he's a fly on the wall over there uh, for this opportunity to preach. I consider him my spiritual father, uh, the man that helped uh, that God used to save my life. And uh, I'm very grateful for him and this opportunity. I'm going to be preaching from uh, Revelation chapter 3 today. So if you could stand for the reading. I know it feels awkward or standing and sitting a lot today. <laughs> Um, if you ever wondered where the standing for the reading came from, you could read Nehemiah chapter 8. And when the priest opened the book, the people stood without even having to be told. So we know this is his holy living and active word. And so... Uh, Revelation chapter 3, uh, verse 1. And to the angel of the church of Sardis write, the words of him who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars, I know your works. You have a reputation of being alive, but you are dead. Wake up. And strengthen what remains and is about to die. For I have not found your works complete in the sight of my God. Remember then what you received and heard. Keep it and repent. If you will not wake up, I will come like a thief. And you will not know at what hour I will come against you. Yet you have still a few names in Sardis, people who have not soiled their garments, and they will walk with me in white, for they are worthy. The one who conquers will be clothed thus in white garments and will never blot his name out of the book of life. I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. He who has an ear, ear let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Let's pray. Father God in heaven, please come now and uh, speak through me. Remove my flesh. Lord, that your word would go forth with power and might that it would go out and accomplish what it intends to.
for we know that it never returns void. Thank you for uh, this church and all that you're doing here. And we feel your presence now. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I received a card here that says House Fund. I'm assuming this is the, the fund that is uh, to demolish the area over here to my left, which is $162 today. So, Pastor, you know that. Um, I also thought I'd come with a challenge for the House Fund uh, myself. Uh, not a challenge, but it's something we're all expected to do, and uh, that is to evangelize the lost. And uh, we know in that area over there that there are many, many people living over there. And we don't intend to demolish that area just to get rid of people. Uh, we intend to uh, make something over there. I think Pastor has a vision, uh, continues to have a vision for a school or whatever it may be. But in the meantime, uh, I challenge you to go and evangelize over there to the lost. In fact, uh, I brought tracks with me this morning. I love carrying Bible tracks with me wherever I go because I never know who I'm going to run into and I never know when I'm going to have the opportunity to share the gospel. And so uh, I think I have 162 tracks probably, if not more. Um, so uh, if you feel led to after church, grab some tracks and Go two by two like the Lord ta taught us to. Don't go alone. Um, I did that a couple weeks ago, went over there uh, looking to uh, evangelize, and people must have migrated for the day uh, because I could find nobody. <laughs> Either that or they heard me coming. Um, uh, but, but go and share the gospel with them. That's, that's what they need. That's what we all need. In fact, that's what the church in Sardis needs. That's the problem with the church in Sardis. If we look at what I just read, it can be broken up into three areas. And I want to read for you the three areas that are broken up. The, the number one thing is the problem, and that is verse 1 and 2. There is a prescription for that problem, which is verse 3 and 4. And then there is a promise, which is verse 5 and verse 6. And so this morning's sermon title I have uh, is called, A Wake-Up Call for the Church in the Times that We Are Living. Because we're living in challenging times right now. I thought about the book of Revelation, and I've actually been doing a study of the book of Revelation here and uh, for, for a, a while. And uh, it's quite an interesting book. Uh, I suggest if you are going to read Revelation that you're very careful reading it. Um, this is a letter from the Apostle John. And it is called the book of Revelation. It doesn't have an S at the end of it. It never does. It's one revelation. And there's many things that take place in this revelation that can seem confusing. And you have to be careful when you read it as to whether you should take some areas literally or symbolically, because if you read it literally, uh, it will come across as a book of Dungeons and Dragons. And that is not what the book of Revelation is. Revelation is a book about the end times. And I truly believe that uh, 
We are in the tribulation. In fact, we've been in the tribulation since Jesus hung from the cross. And I know that there's one thing that the church stands united on, and that is the gospel. Uh, there are second things that we can talk about, which are things like eschatology. Um, but, but for me, I will say that we are in the tribulation. And we're experiencing that right now. And uh, I don't enjoy particularly talking about dead churches. Um, and so it's very difficult taking a look at this text. Uh, what makes it even more difficult is sitting and thinking about, is this Grace Gospel Fellowship? And I would, after thinking many days about it, I would, I would truly say no, that it's not. Because the gospel is being preached here. <laughs> The gospel is preached here week after week, and if you don't hear it, it's because the Spirit of the Lord hasn't awakened your soul yet. But there are things in this letter to Sardis that we can take away from and be very weary of. Because it is time to wake up. It's time for the church to wake up. This church around our nation needs to wake up. And right now what God is actually doing to the church is he's sifting it. And we're finding churches closing day after day after day. And then we're seeing some congregations growing. And what's interesting about that is the congregations that are growing are the ones that are preaching the gospel. And the ones, the ones that are having their doors closed uh, are the ones that are not preaching the gospel. They're, they're just preaching fluffity fluff. <laughs> it's that, that stuff that you buy at the grocery store, the marshmallow fluff. The gospel that makes you feel good. The gospel about having your best life now. And I'm telling you, you're not about to have your best life now uh, because we are in some difficult times. And so um, my vision specifically really is aimed at for Grace Gospel Fellowship that we, uh, that we know that we're living in a time where God is sifting the church and we f are finding out really who God's people are. I want us to look over to Romans chapter 8 real quick. It's a familiar book with this church, I know. Uh, Romans chapter 8. Or excuse me, Romans chapter 1. Sorry, Romans chapter 8. That's pastor's text, that's not mine. Uh, Ro Romans chapter 1. Um, well, starting at verse... 24. I'm going to read down quite a bit because I want you to see what is happening. Romans 1 verse 24 says, Therefore God gave them up in the lust of their hearts to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves, because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie, worshipped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. For this reason, God gave them up to a dishonorable passions. For, for women exchanged natural relations for those that are contrary to nature. And the men likewise gave up natural relations which women, uh, with women and were consumed with passion for one another. Men committing shameless acts with men and receiving 
in themselves the due penalty for their error. And since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased mind to do what ought not to be done. They were filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, malice. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, maliciousness. They are gossip, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless. They know God's righteous decree that those who practice such things deserve to die. They not only do them, but give approval to those who practice them. Those are the times we're living in. <laughs> Those are the times that we're living in. The first portion that I read to you, of uh, verse 24 and 25, is what we know as the sexual revolution that this country went through. Verse 26 ver through 27 is the homosexual rev revolution that this country has gone through that we know of. And verse 28 is God just giving us over to a debased mind to do whatever we want. And we've reached that point, folks. We've reached that point where things are now entering the church. Things like critical race theory, things like wokeness, all manner of things that can only be answered with one thing, and that's the gospel. And the reason these churches are falling wayside, closing their doors, is because they believe the church is here to fix social issues. And the church exists for one thing, to preach the gospel. I turned the news off over a year ago. I was just so uh, fed up with the brainwashing and the uh, just the craziness of this world. What's happening over in Afghanistan right now is an absolute tragedy. What happened to our soldiers and what has happened to Christians over there that are being persecuted for their faith. Folks in China right now that are having to hide down in basements in order to have church. This is where we're headed, folks, in this country. This is truly where we are headed. And this is the church of Sardis. The church that wasn't preaching the gospel. And so I told you that there was a problem. The problem is, and what Jesus says to this church, you are dead. You are dead. And so verse 1 says, And to the angel of the church of Sardis write the words of him who has the seven spirits of God. And so to, to kind of help explain some things here, the seven spirits of God is not some mystical uh, thing that exists here so we don't know what it means. The seven, star, the seven spirits of God are the Holy Spirit in his fullness. If you look over to Isaiah chapter 11, you'll find that very uh, passage in verse 2 where that is explained. I, don't, I know I tend to preach long and I would go there, but you can look for yourselves later. But the seven spirits of God are the Holy Spirit in his fullness, and the seven stars are actually the seven pastors of these churches that Jesus has written to. So just to give you a little context, the number seven in the book of Revelation is a number of completeness. The number three 
is the best number in Revelation because that's the sign of the Trinity. The Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. And you will see the Trinity throughout the uh, book of Revelation if you study it. But moving along in verse 1, it says, I know your works, you have the reputation of being alive, but you are dead. Wake up and strengthen what remains and is about to die, for I have not found your works complete in the sight of my God. And so the problem is here is, is that they're dead, that they're not preaching the gospel. And what does it mean by dead? If you look at this word dead, it means the same thing it means in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1, that you were dead in your trespasses and sins. It means the same thing that it says in Colossians 2, verse 13, and you who were dead in your trespasses and uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all, us all of our trespasses. And so they were dead because the gospel wasn't being preached. And I can tell you what the problem was. If you turn to Acts 17, uh, you'll find the situation that Sardis is in. Sardis is located in an area where there is a heavy Jewish population, but also a heavy pagan Roman culture. And they're stuck right dab in the middle of both of these. And if you look at uh, Acts chapter 17, verse 1, uh, you can begin to see this. It says, Now when they had passed through and Amphipolis and uh, Apollo, Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, <laughs> where there was a synagogue of the Jews. And Paul went in, and it was his custom on the Sabbath, uh, three Sabbath days, he reasoned with them from the scriptures. He, now we're talking about the, the Jews here. He reasoned with them from the scriptures, explaining and proving that it was necessary for, for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead. And saying, this Jesus whom I proclaim to you is Christ. He's sharing with the Jews the gospel. And now if we move over to verse 22, where Paul addresses uh, at the Areopagus, he's talking now to the pagan Roman culture. He says in verse 22, So Paul, standing in the midst of the Areopagus, said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in every way you are very religious. For I passed along and observed the objects of your worship and found also an altar with this inscription to the unknown God. What therefore you worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you, that God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. And so Sardis is in the middle of both of them. And so what Sardis has done is they've compromised. They've compromised and they are not preaching the gospel. And in fact, that's why the Lord is saying to them in this letter that he writes to them, I know your works, you have the reputation of being alive, but you're dead. They have the reputation of being alive. What does that mean? Well, I think for a while we saw what it meant for churches to have the reputation of being alive, but now are dead. Churches filled to the max, parking lots filled to the max that are not so anymore. Pastors falling left and right, some for morality issues, others because churches are closing down because the gospel is not being preached. Many buildings, fancy buildings, 
And so they looked like this rep, they had this reputation of being alive, but they were really dead. And so that is the problem with Sardis. They're right smack dab between a really tough area. But you know what? When the going gets tough, the tough get going. And when you're in the middle of a tough area, there's only one thing to do. That's to preach the gospel. And so ultimately, what was the problem in Sardis? They were dead. <laughs> Paul says, For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. The gospel of Jesus Christ. God before time writing down in the Lamb's book of life the names of those who would be saved. And out of his love and kindness created everything that you see. Created man and woman. In his, in his image, he created us in the image of God. And he said that that was very good. But, um, be, but Adam and Eve, uh, because of their uh, sin... By eating the, of the fruit of the tree in the midst of the garden that God commanded them not to do or touch it, lest you die, we've all been plunged into sin. We've all been plunged into sin. But God, we've all been plunged into sin and now... Years pass, right? Years keep on rolling. Sin keeps on moving. Times keep on getting more wicked and more wicked. So much so that <laughs> God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. God flooded the world and killed everyone except those that were on the ark. But in His mercy... God in time sends his son into the world. <laughs> born of a virgin. Born under the law. Dies the death of a sinner on the cross. Where he hung. As God the father poured out his wrath on his son for the sin of those who've been written in the Lamb's book of life. For their sin, he poured out his wrath on them. And poured out his wrath on Christ. And as Christ took his last breath, he said, it is finished. It's complete. Our salvation has been accomplished. And for those who repent and believe the gospel, you have received salvation in Christ. See, that, that's the gospel message that was not being preached in Sardis. See, Christ, in his death, in his passive obedience, takes away our sin. But in his active obedience, living under the law, fulfilling the law of God, gives us his righteousness. <laughs> so not only is our sin forgiven, but we're also given the righteousness of God. Without righteousness, we'll stand before God guilty.
And so that, my friends, brings me to verse 2. Wake up. Wake up, you've heard the gospel. Wake up and strengthen what remains. And is about to die, for I have not found your works complete in the sight of my God. So now I have the prescription. Verse 3. Remember then what you received and heard. At some point in time, they heard the gospel. At some point in time, they heard the gospel from somewhere. Some of them heard it. And so Jesus says, remember then what you've received and heard, and keep it and repent. What a word. What a word. We don't use that word much today anymore. Repent. What does repent mean? Well, it means for me to turn and walk away from my sin. What does it really mean when we're born again? That we're given the very nature of God. We've been given the righteousness of Christ. It means now that we are cut off from this world. We are no longer of this world. We live in this world, but we're not of this world. Actually, now I will take you to Romans chapter 8. <laughs> because I want to encourage you this morning. I want to encourage you to cut it off. Cut this world off. It's going to crush you and kill you. It's only going to draw you back into sin. And we don't want you to be there. We don't want you to be there. Romans chapter 8, verse 7. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God. For it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Now listen. <laughs> you, however, are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If, in fact, the Spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him. But if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the Spirit is life because of righteousness. If the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your moral bodies through his Spirit who dwells in you. So then, brothers... We are debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. Put to death the deeds of the body. Repent of your sin. Enter into the righteousness that's been given to you. Grow in your faith. Stop feeding on the baby milk. And get into the richness of the word. And the depth of what God has given us in this book. We will never reach the fathoms of this book. In fact, we will spend eternity probably having some of our theology corrected. <laughs> but we will spend eternity learning the richness and goodness and greatness of God and His Word. And so this prescription 
I know 1203, the bells are tolling, and uh, I know what that means. Sorry, Pastor. Um, uh, <laughs> but verse 3 says this Remember then what you received and heard, keep it and repent. Continue on, if you will not wake up, I will come like a thief. And you will not know what hour I will come against you. Every time God refers to Jesus as a thief, he's referring to him as coming in the night. And you don't know the hour that he's coming. Mark chapter 13. You don't know when the master of the house will come. He will come like a thief in the night. But I have good news. I had the prescription. You've heard it. That's enter to enter into the gospel and the fullness thereof. To put to death the deeds of the body to repent of your sins daily, momently, <laughs> millisecondly, if that's a word. <laughs> Let me uh, be very blunt. Uh, I'm not just talking up here about the church of the United States in whole. There is a problem with the church in the United States and whole, but I'm also talking about Grace Gospel Fellowship. And what's hard for me is that I have to say to some of you in here, you need to wake up. I love you dearly. I do. I love this. This is my family. But I got to tell some of you brothers and sisters, you got to wake up. Amen. He's coming again. It's real. And it's coming quick. Like a thief in the night. And so the promise is this. Verse uh, 4. Yet you still have a few names and stars, people who have not soiled their garments. And they will walk with me in white. For they are worthy. The one who conquers will be clothed thus in white garments. And I will never blot his name out of the book of life. I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Revelation uh, chapter 19. And I'm going to land the plane here. Pastor Clark, I promise you. Revelation 19. I mean, it's been so long since I've been up here. I mean, give me a break. <laughs> Revel <laughs> Revelation uh, chapter 19, verse 6. Then I heard what seemed to be a voice of a great multitude, like the roar of many waters and like the sound of the mighty peals of thunder crying out, Hallelujah, for the Lord our God, the Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and exult and give him the glory for the marriage of the lamb has come and he has made, and his bride has made herself ready. It was granted her. Now listen to this. It was granted her to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure. Did I not just say that? Yes. I just said that. In verse 5 and verse 6, the one who conquers will be clothed thus in white garments. And I will never blot his name out of the book of life. And can you imagine this one day? Imagine this one day. When you stand before God Almighty and Jesus is standing there as your representative. And he says, Greta... He says, Greta, meet God. Amen. 
And God looks at her and says, she's clothed in white garments. Amen. Father, look at Space Monkey. <laughs> what a name he has, but he's clothed in white garments. God, look at Ryan and Sarah. God, look at uh, Rob and Christine. And I could go around the room. I could go around the room. But I beg you to be clothed in the white garments. I beg, I beg that, that you don't enter into this nonsense that was happening in Sardis. Because this is one of the strongest warnings that Jesus gives to the churches in Revelation. If not, the strongest. Because if you read the other letters, he talks about some of the works that they've done and some of the faithful things that they've done. But to Sardis, he says, you're dead. And I don't, I don't want any one to be dead in here. Because the alternative is real, folks. You're either going to heaven or you're going to hell for eternity. And in hell for eternity, there will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. And in hell fire for eternity, God will be pouring his wrath out on them. But God, because of his glorious gospel and his son, and if the spirit of God has spoke to your heart today and you've heard the gospel, I'm going to do what my old pastor told me to do many years ago when I first started coming to this church. He didn't, he didn't do altar calls. He used to tell us to go home, climb under your mattress, and cry out to God. Amen. If you've heard the gospel this morning, and it has resonated in your heart for the first time, go home, climb under your mattress, and cry out to God that you too would be saved. And for the brethren in, in, in here, I pray today that God has used his word to strengthen you and grow you and that you continue to plunge deeper and deeper into his word. Let's pray. Father God, you are the almighty one the maker of heaven and earth, the one who will return one day. And I believe it's one day soon. I believe we're going to see it. <laughs> I really do. I don't know why, God, but I'm just speaking from my heart. I, I, I believe you're coming. And, and even if you don't, and something takes us now, how glorious it will be to be with you. As the seraphim right now are crying out to you, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is filled with his glory. We sit here and give you all glory and honor this morning. Lord, it's all about you. May you receive honor and praise today. I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Sing 
Hallelujah. Sing hallelujah to our God. Lord. Glory hallelujah to our God. Every praise. Every praise. Every praise is to our God. Take it up, take it up, take it up. Every praise is to our God. Every word. Every word of worship. One accord. One accord. Every praise. Every praise. Every praise. Every praise. To our God. To our God. Pray for Dwayne. God, our Father, you are the great healer. And Lord, you, uh, you know what is going on with Dwayne right now. And you are sovereign and in charge of all. Lord, I pray uh, that you would heal him by your might and by your power. And we know that uh, you can do all things. Yes, Lord. And that whatever you're doing in this time, you will be glorified. Yes. So I just pray that you would give Dwayne peace. Yes. And Lord, I just, uh, I just love this brother, as I know many in here do the same. Yes. Lord, I pray also for all those who may be ailing in this church. Yes. Anyone that may be sick in this church, Lord, that you would touch their bodies and heal them. Yes, Lord. You're a mighty God, Lord. and we love you. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 Amen.